James II succeeded his brother upon Charles's death in 1685. He showed all the political tone deafness of his predecessors. James was a committed Catholic and sought to re-establish England as a Catholic nation. This pleased almost no one in England. He also began rebuilding the army, still a symbol of oppression. His unpopular rule precipitated the Parliament to invite the daughter of the King and her husband, William III, to depose James. The invitation was delivered clandestinely by a former Admiral, Arthur Herbert. Herbert had refused to serve under James and resigned. In what became known by the rather grandiose name of the Glorious Revolution, William sailed into London to claim the throne in 1688. He brought with him an army with men, horses and weapons. The Dutch troops were brought over at the request of the Parliament in order to deal with the troops supporting the English King. In exchange, William would be allowed to wear the throne. The Dutch troops would not be needed. James panicked and fled from his daughter and her husband. His men saw no reason to fight for him. The most powerful weapon that the new king brought over was a printing press, allowing for the propaganda to take immediate effect and to propagate the myth of the Glorious Revolution. The invading fleet had been led by Arthur Herbert. The Royal Navy did nothing to stop it, and William III and Mary II reigned over England jointly. Herbert went on to become the first Lord of the Admiralty. The fugitive James II fled to Scotland, then to France to muster support for his effort to reclaim the throne. These supporters were known as the Jacobites, from the Latin origin of the name James. The English Parliament largely supported the overthrow of James. Those members were known as the Whigs. However, there were parliamentary supporters of the Divine Writer Kings who did not support William III. They were known as the Tories. Tory was, a, was an insulting name given by the Whigs, which at the time referred to an Irish highwayman or rogue. Whig referred to Scottish Presbyterians. Tory and Whig re-emerged during the American Revolution, in reference to the Loyalists and Rebels respectively. The Tories fled to Canada, and the Whigs stayed on to form a pioneering American political party. A fractured and divided Whig party disbanded in the 1850s. Many of its members, including one Abraham Lincoln, went over to and largely took over the nascent Republican Party. During the final stages of the American Civil War, Southerners in favour of negotiations with the North were called either Tories or Reconstructionists. James led his supporters into Ireland, where he enjoyed support from the Catholic population. He also secured support from Louis XIV, the Catholic King of France. James and Louis were like-minded on the topic of a sovereign's right to rule. Louis XIV is best rem remembered for the quote, L'État c'est moi. I am the state. James hoped to use Ireland as a base to take back control of his kingdom. The Jacobites also mounted an insurrection from Scotland. In Ireland, his forces met resistance from Irish Protestant Williamites. The dynastic battle between the Jacobites and the Williamites was part of a larger series of a, a larger European conflict that historians call the Nine Years' War. I think I've already referred to another Nine Years' War in previous videos. This is a different Nine Years' War. So it was a uh, sprawling, chaotic conflict that reached the shores of Asia and the Americas, truly a world war in a sense. England under William III joined the Grand Alliance, which aimed to contain emergent French aggression under Louis XIV. The Siege of Derry in 1689 was a key battle in the Irish War. In what is present-day Northern Ireland, a Scottish Protestant enclave was besieged by the Jacobite army. James II led the army, seeking back his throne and his reputation after fleeing from the Williamite invaders. Thirteen apprentice boys shut the gates to the city, locking out the Jacobite army. The slogan of the Scots was, No Surrender. The siege lasted three months before the Scots were rescued by the Royal Navy. The siege is still commemorated today as a parade of the apprentice boys of Derry. This parade has historically been a very controversial parade and is often met with violent protests. Greater mediation and the Northern Ireland peace process of the 1990s between the two sides has led to a cessation of violence, but the practice remains very controversial. During World War I, the Ulster Regiment repeated the cry, No Surrender, during the Somme Offensive in 1916. 
One third of the 15,000 man brigade perished within two days. The opposite term for no surrender, unconditional surrender, comes from General Ulysses S. Grant in 1862 in reply to a letter from General Buckner offering a negotiated cessation of hostilities in the wake of the Battle of Fort Donaldson. Grant replied, No terms except unconditional and immediate surrender can be accepted. Northern newspapers picked up the phrase and Union men, favourable to the popular general, called him Unconditional Surrender Grant, a play on his initials.